Hello friends, it's Kayla. Welcome back to my channel. This is the first video in a three-part series this year where I try to find new favorite authors. What I mean by that is for an author to be considered an all-time favorite from me, I need to have given them three five stars or I'll take a 4.5. I did this assessment maybe about a year ago and in this video I talked about all the authors who have met that threshold and how I'm not happy with that list of authors. I just want there to be more on that list and some of them like it was only one series that I've loved from them or I read the, those five stars so long ago and their newest releases haven't done it for me. And I also talked about a list of authors who I think could hit that, ones that I feel have potential. I've given them five stars before, maybe five stars multiple times. And so this three-part series this year we're going to read from nine authors and hopefully get that third five star. Today we've got three authors to talk about who all have recent releases that I'm excited about. So first let's talk Celeste Ng. First we need to find those five stars. One is right here with Little Fires Everywhere. And the other one is white. There it is. Everything I never told you. I've said before that Celeste Ng I find has kind of forgettable stories, but I love them so much in the moment and always give her five stars. They're family dramas. They're equally beautiful and sad, but I don't remember the plot really well. But I, of course, picked up her latest release, Our Missing Hearts, and all I know is it's a family drama and I'm sure it's equally sad and beautiful. The next author I have read two five stars from and they were both YA and that's Adiba Jagadar. The first one I read from her is The Henna Wars. I thought this was so lovely. And then after that, she came out with Hani and Ishu's Guide to Fake Dating. I think this was a 4.5, maybe it was a five. These both feature sapphic relationships and hit my favorite tropes, fake dating and a competition. So of course I pre-ordered her 2022 release, A Million to One. I don't think there is one relationship at the focus of this, but rather we have four young women and it involves a heist on the Titanic. And to keep it a mix of genres, we've got an adult contemporary, a YA historical, and then we're gonna do a thriller. Ashley Winstead wrote one of my favorite thrillers in 2021 with In My Dreams I Hold a Knife. I've always said this is not like a groundbreaking book. It was just exactly what I needed in the moment. A lot of people have read it, it's gotten a mixed reaction. But then I picked up this author's romance in my like romance experiment series last year and also gave this one Fool Me Once five stars. Since that video series was a secret for so long, I had many people in the months leading up to posting it who were asking me when I was going to pick up another Ashley Winstead. The Last Housewife was one of my most anticipated reads of last year, but I realized once I had given Fool Me Once five stars that I could include her in this third Times a Charm season three. If you haven't been here since the series began, the first season there was three episodes where I hated two books from an author and wanted to try for a third time to see if I just always hated them or if there was a chance for them to be amazing. In the second season, I explored a bunch of authors who I loved one book from and disliked one and the third time a charm was to decide, should I keep picking them up or was it a one hit wonder? And now we're in season three. I know this deals with a lot of dark topics. It has to do with cults and abuse and sex. This is the one of the three I'm most apprehensive getting into for sure. I actually also don't read a lot of historical books and I am picky about the adult, like literary and contemporary that I pick up. And this having to do with cults could be you know, hit or miss. So here's everything that I'm reading for this first video and I'll check in with you as soon as I start one of them. So I just remembered I actually have the audiobook of Our Missing Hearts because Libro FM had it as part of their affiliate program earlier, like, I don't know, mid, whenever this came out, like midway, end of 2022. And so I picked it up knowing that I was gonna listen to it soon. Um, so that's exciting. And Lucy Liu narrates it, which I don't know if I knew that and that's why I picked it up, but it was such a pleasant surprise because I think she's done a couple audiobooks, but it's not like a real thing for her. So it, it feels very exciting. So I, M. 14% of the way through the book. I don't know how many chapters that is, but I'm enough into it that I get the general premise and someone is about to back into the parking spot right next to me. So hold on. I'm currently at the library. Hopefully they get out and don't just sit next to me. That's the worst parking job I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> just fully in two whole parking spots. <laughs> He's trying again. You can do it. Nope. No, no, no. Turn your wheel. No. No, you have to try again. Third time's a charm. Oh no, that's it. All right. Let me show you what I got. I got this for my next cozy mystery episode. I got this for a book club that I talked to you about recently. I got Astrid Parker doesn't fail. So now I need to plan 
a romance video and then I got Africa Risen. I was planning on buying these two and then I was like, let me check my library and they were there. Anyway, I didn't bring the book with me. It's a dystopian kind of story, which is a bit different. And we're introduced right off the bat to this young boy who goes by Bird, but later in life goes by Noah. Well, I guess at different times he goes by Noah. So it's always fun following a kid who's the same age as my kid and just seeing like how they think. His mom left their family a couple years ago and the government is really controlling and has a big focus on like American values and taking away books, media, even children from families that they think don't um, follow American values because they're worried about what they're calling like foreign influence. So Noah slash Bird's mom left the family three years ago and then he gets this note implying that she is alive and well and maybe wants to get his attention and I think he from here is going to be involved or be some kind of leader of taking down this system, fighting against the government control along with his mother. I'm not really sure, but it's well written. I really like the narration and I'm having a good time. I'm just picking Liam up from school and it's currently snowing, which it was just like two days ago that I told Rob that it felt like spring was coming and I was really excited about it. And now we're approaching the deep negatives again and it is snowing, so that's a bummer. So those are all my updates for now. When I read more of the book, I'll check in with you. That's how a reading vlog works. All right. It's a new day. I'm still in the vehicle. Well, I'm not still. I, I have left the vehicle. Now I'm back in the vehicle. I'm having a great day. It's full of meetings and appointments and work stuff, and I just feel reinvigorated in life. And between some meetings, I decided to stop at um, the used bookstore. I haven't sold books in a really long time. It has to have been years. Um, and I just wanted to see if I could make any money on books because I feel like the last few times, the only times I've gone to sell books, I bring this huge box and they want like two or three out of the entire thing, which is totally fine. But then I'm just like hauling this huge box back and forth and then I end up dropping it all off at the thrift store anyway or the women's shelter or put it in free little libraries or whatever. And I could have just skipped that in between like five dollar used bookstore trip but so i did a little unhaul and i split all of my books into three um stacks one that i thought were quality enough that i could sell one for free little library so all of the arcs um, i put a lot of ya in free little libraries and then another stack for just like donating more broadly that isn't like the highest quality or i think has more of a niche audience but so i took some of my 2022 brand new purchases that i didn't like to the used bookstore um, and like my copy of Gemina that I know I talked about in a recent video that I was referring to in past tense. I was like, I used to have a paperback. The paperback was sitting right behind me. In my mind, she had already left my world. <laughs> but so I took my box of books in to Ted's paperbacks and she bought the entire box except for three things. Like, how wild. So I just got an $80 credit at the used bookstore. And of course, I picked some things out. Like it's a win because I also found things that I'm interested in. I found When We Were Birds. This cover is so stunning. I've had this on my radar for a minute. I've always wanted to read Passing and I've never been like seeking it out. So I'm sure it has been around, but it just, the spine popped out at me. So I grabbed that. And then I got The Villa. I guess it came out in 2022, but I liked Reckless Girls more than I thought. So I've had this on in the back of my mind. And then I grabbed Things Fall Apart, which I need to scratch off a couple of things off of my classics poster thing. And I was reading through the titles to see how many I can scratch off. I think there was two. And then I noticed this title on there and I was like, oh, I could easily find that. And then I found it. Now I'm gonna stop at HomeSense because I really wanna buy some flowers and a new vase because I got rid of mine a while ago now and I haven't replaced it. So whenever someone brings home flowers, I put it, I've been putting it in a honey jar. Anyway, I feel like because it's February, it's gonna be springtime in HomeSense and they will have some flowers and things. Where am I at with my book, you ask? I'm 33% of the way through. Still solely doing the audiobook cause like I'm running around. I have a lot of things to do, a lot of driving. So it's going well. Also that's gonna to continue tonight, tonight because Rob's going for wings with some friends. So I'm gonna drop him off and then take Liam to hockey and then go pick him up from the bar and then pick up Liam and then go home. And the book is going really well. I don't know that I could have told you this was Celeste Ng if the author's name wasn't attached to it. It doesn't feel like the character focused story that I'm used to and the family dynamics. We obviously have a family, but it's more so about like this world and this one character's experience understanding like censorship. And I feel like there is this 
interesting reference that maybe I'm just making up and the author isn't intending to do it, but I feel like the whole censorship conversation is in the world as a whole, but it also feels like it's happening within a family and maybe it's this commentary on like withholding things from your children as well because there's this sense of this kid just being told when the police or when the government officials are around you just agree with everything they say you don't ruffle any feathers don't do anything questionable because bad things will happen but when you don't tell the child you know what bad things will happen or why the world is built this way it's like they might be more inclined to go against what you said because they haven't fully understood your reasoning and obviously there's something to be said for having age appropriate conversations and when your children can fully comprehend things but i do think that adults need to give kids more credit with what they are able to understand so it's so easy for bird to make these mistakes and not understand them to be mistakes because they don't actually make sense to him and his own morals and maybe that's a good thing because he does need to fight against these things so maybe it would be doing him a disservice to fully explain everything because then he would be more understanding of it and more accepting of it. I don't know if any of that made sense, but I'm gonna continue with my day and I'll see you soon. <laughs> so HomeSense did indeed have not just spring, but Easter exploding absolutely everywhere. I grabbed one plant. I can't keep real plants alive, so I thought this was cute. And then I wanted to find a vase that could go with it so I could, since getting Rob the PS5 and Liam his VR for Christmas and putting away all my Christmas stuff. I haven't like put anything here decor wise and clearly that's not enough. I think I spent 20 minutes picking out a base. They were all white. I think a lot of them were too modern, too sleek. Like I wanted a pattern to it, but then there was ones that were just too cool for me. The only ones that weren't white were green. I didn't know if they would go. I feel like my house doesn't really have a color theme this time of year, but I ended up getting this one that is white, which I feel like it's too much white, but once I, you know, actually put flowers in it, which I completely forgot, then that'll be the color. Maybe it needs a little tray. I don't know. I don't like what's going on here, but I'll figure it out. <laughs> Maybe I'll leave that vase there and we'll see how many days it takes for Rob to put flowers in it and for him to notice that there's an empty vase. I also stopped at Indigo just for one thing episode 13. It was on sale. And then while I was there, of course, I got distracted by the little tchotchke section. So I got this for Rob. It's a screen cleaner. I guess it sprays and cleans and it's a phone stand. Built-in microfiber cloth exterior. I'm thinking tablet, phone, computer screen. I also found my Kindle, my e-reader. Um, I was cleaning out my closet yesterday, really trying to go hard with this spring cleaning. Getting books out of here, getting clothes out of here. I have two bags of clothes to donate. And then this is my free little library. Oh my God, <laughs> bag of donations. And then this one is my other donation bag. This just going to I don't know. But those are all ones that I like mostly bought secondhand or bought as seconds. So they have the little mark on the bottom. You know the vibe. So I'll deal with those tomorrow. It seemed like a little too big of an endeavor today, especially since I'm not done my closet. I'm almost done and I found my Kindle. It was like under my big Alex nine drawer. Anyway, last thing I got from Indigo because there's a missing spot. There's a hole in the wall. Let's head over there anyway, actually, and scratch off the poster. I'm kind of a calendar fiend. So the one on the fridge has everything that we're up to as a family. And then I have this little one just on the desk for fun. I also have a weekly calendar and a yearly calendar in my room for like notebooks. So I always have a calendar going on this wall, but it doesn't need to have any writing on it. So I found one that's just mostly pictures. So let's see, we are missing the enjoyment of January, but that's okay because it's like the same color as my wall, which is a little weird actually. February, oh, February's just all the fruits. Cute, what's my birthday month? More fruits. I mean, it's all fruit, but this one's all fruit. Oh, and then April's bananas. Wow, incredible, stunning. Moving into the poster. Oh, there's Things Fall Apart. In 2022, I read Never Let Me Go. Let's get that one off. I didn't like it. That was actually in my donations today, I think. In 2023, I'm reading The Little Prince. I'm reading The Princess Bride and 
I'm reading A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I DNF the Time Traveler's Wife a long time ago, so I feel like I should be able to scratch that off. And I'm pretty sure I've read The Catcher in the Rye, but I can't guarantee that, so I'm not scratching it off. I definitely need to read The Shadow of the Wind. I know people ask me all the time, like, if I'm trying to scratch all this off, like, I should make a video series about it. Which one am I reading next? I, I do, I'm not actually intentionally doing anything. It's just when I happen to read something. I think this is fun on the wall. I could have sworn I read something else. Maybe I was thinking Lord of the Flies or Hamlet because I read those both in 2022, but like I had already read them. So I had already scratched them off. It's a new day. This morning I woke up. I put Liam on the bus to school. I walked on my walking pad for like half an hour while I listened to some more of the audiobook. I made breakfast. I watched the challenge. Fantastic oh my god episode. We're almost done the season, which is very exciting. And then I took some bookmark pictures. There are some beautiful amethysts in the mix for February. And now I need to film my January wrap up. And I went to the drugstore, I didn't mention yesterday, and Dove was back on the shelves, their dry shampoo, which I know this conversation isn't going to interest very many people, but I talked about how Dove is the only one that ever worked for me and then they have terrible things in them so they all got pulled off the shelves and then I used Batiste and it's as bad as I remember. But then this was back so obviously they removed or changed whatever the ingredients are, which I mean could very well mean that they replaced it with something else that's equally terrible in five years we're gonna find out that we're all dying. But I bought it to try it and I'm already noticing and it says on here no visible residue and I think like that is the difference between dry shampoos that work for me and don't. The ones that don't have any like whiteness to them are the ones that don't work. So whatever was causing the white residue is probably the stuff that was bad so like I should be happy that it's gone but I just don't think this is gonna work. The old cans they had a little sticker that said building girls self-esteem down here and that's missing from here so that's what's different with dove it's not about the new ingredients it's that we're no longer building girl self-esteem it's the same with deodorant like using a clear deodorant has never done anything for me i need to see it needs to be thick <laughs> that did nothing but i'll pretend it did and it'll get me through filming until i can shower later today it just takes me so long to dry my hair. My wrap up's probably gonna take so long to film because I read 32 things in January. But the good news is my book is going well. I've passed the halfway mark now. I guess I wasn't really expecting us to be following the mother's journey, um, but we are, so that's interesting. I think what I'm enjoying the most is that there are stories. I think I expected there to be more stories once we got the first one. I thought that would be more of a regular part of the book, which makes the audiobook fun to listen to because anytime there's like kind of a fairy tale element. It's fun to be listening to someone tell you that story because I'm sure many of us grew up with, you know, fairy tales being read aloud to us. But that hasn't come into play a ton, um, but with it being a story about books and censorship, I just like how the story within the story gave those vibes but it wasn't heavy-handed about its message there was just this short tale we got to read about a boy and being in a room and drawing cats on the wall and i think there's definitely a lot of takeaways with that the idea of creating art from nothing um that creativity will persevere no matter the situation that it's innate to the human experience to want to create and that your creations will turn into something more. So like everything starts with something, I guess. Who knows if that's what the author's trying to say, but those are my takeaways with the intent. That's one side done. I'm gonna do that one. I'm gonna film. I'm gonna read. Right now, do I foresee this being a five star? I'm not sure. I think it could be, but right now it feels like a four. I have been waiting all day for the sun to come out so I can film like a whole video and clips for this, but it's just not happening. It's now late afternoon. Liam's already home from school. So I've just been reading instead of filming which is just fine with me. I have officially finished this. Oh, and I'll have you know, the first thing Rob said when he got home from work yesterday was a compliment to my vase. So that's pretty cool. We're officially on day two of nothing in my vase. Let's see how far it goes. This I'm ultimately giving a four. So technically I can't consider Celeste an all-time favorite author, even though she feels like she should be in that category. I need to wait. Maybe the next one will be the one. I think I'm gonna find it hard to explain to you why this didn't get a five and why I think it'll be a four for like everyone. <laughs> like if I just glance at the Goodreads, all of my friends have given this a four. I know it was technically in the sixth place in the Goodreads Choice Awards in the fiction category and that like 
feels right for it. Like nobody's absolute, like this is nobody's new favorite book of all time. And so maybe that makes your decision right there if you're gonna pick this up or not, because this was $36. With the rising price of books, I just feel like mentioning it because it's an investment. <laughs> like my book collection has become an investment and I want everyone to spend their money wisely. I think you will appreciate this book. If you have loved other Celeste Ings and you pick this up, I think you will appreciate it. I think all of the takeaways are extremely clear. It's obviously just from the synopsis alone, a cautionary tale. She took a lot of real life hatred and showed us what the world looks like um, if that takes over. It's also about the importance of protest and revolution. And these are all great conversations that we need to be you know, having in real life society. The storytelling was good and it was easy to follow. It just didn't have the punch to it that I expected, not just because of who wrote it, but because of the type of story that it is. I just didn't feel that like heart wrenching experience that you would expect when you're dealing with a child who isn't with his mother and then is trying so hard to fight against various things and in that also trying to find his mother. But I think because the concept is strong and it feels so relevant and it said so many good things, I want this to be a five and I know that it could have been a five. Anyway, I'm now already a hundred pages into this one. A Million to One by Adiba Jagadar is about four girls who board the Titanic um, with the intention of stealing something of value and having a better life when they get off the boat. At this point, a third of the way in, we have very well established characters, who they are, the world that they came from, the world that they want in the future, and their relationship with each other. There is kind of a budding romance between two of the girls. We've got Josepha, Hina, Violet, and Emily. One of them has like come from the circus. I think she's the character I'm most interested in at this point but they do all feel like equally important and main characters. I feel like this is gonna make me want to rewatch the Titanic and I'm interested to know if I'll like, if there will be any references like to the movie. Well, cause the movie also referenced real life and some of the characters who were real people. I don't know enough about the real tragedy um, to notice those things unless they were referenced in the movie and then I would probably associate it with like a movie reference. Obviously this is in no way supposed to be a love story, a retelling of like the movie, but I just think naturally with such a well-known film, maybe you'd expect some similar vibes. So we'll see. All right, two thirds of the way through now. And I just think that it's doing this book a disservice that I have read the heist book. Like when you hear about a book about a heist, you think about Six of Crows. I'm not even a big Lee Bardugo fan, but Six of Crows is so objectively good. And it's like the heist book. And maybe it's because it's the only heist book that I've read. And it has to do with a group of characters working together. And there's a leader, just nothing could ever live up to the characterization the group dynamic in here. And so I don't want to be sitting here comparing it, but I just can't help it. It's not fair. It's not right. This book is bringing so much that is unique to this story. But I think just because the nature of Six of Crows leans more adult, even though it's young adult, and this leans more middle grade, though it's young adult, just with how kind of soft it feels and how easy the characters are getting through everything, like every conflict that arises. On the next page, you know it's gonna be okay. I'm just not wowed, which is unfortunate because at this point, like I already know it's not gonna be a five and I just wanna cancel the whole video. What I will say is there's definitely drama. There is running around, escaping. Um, they have this woman on the ship who's not responsible for them, but sees that they're all young women who don't have proper chaperones. And so she's very aware of them and is caring for them in a way and taking responsibility. And she at every turn, is like, what are you guys up to, you meddling kids? <laughs> Let me wrap it up and give you my final thoughts. Actually, first, you might hear my husband playing video games in the background. So he's home and you know he pulled through with some beautiful flowers. Here they are in all their fuchsia glory. What a guy. All right, friends, it's looking like a 3.5, I think. 
for a million to one. I really respect this for a lot of reasons. The author's note at the end that talks about like the actual tragedy of the Titanic, um, the victims, the accuracy, the commentary on like the characters of color that she has in here versus what would be actually realistic on the Titanic, how people would be treated, the things that are accurate versus fictionalized and why. I respect the story that we followed in here, um, the realizations that were made with the characters. There was just the right amount of drama. I feel like if you go into this wanting like the movie kind of vibes, there is enough of that. Like you have similar scenes as far as like um, places filling up with water, maybe bad people chasing people around with a weapon, um, the deciding who goes on uh, the boat. And then it's not a completely happy ending as it wasn't in, in reality for a lot of people. But then there was that hope filled um, kind of flash forward. And then I guess just talking about this author, like this is her foray into something other than just a young adult romance. And those no doubt take skill to write, but this, you know, it takes more research, more thought, more just like plot development. And not every book is going to be an author's best book. Not every book needs to be my favorite book. Officially, I guess <laughs> she's another author, not on my all time favorites yet. Um, but there is hope for the future. And I just remembered I'm supposed to be reading a story from this every day. Haven't done that. But the only author that I've read from in here, I think, is Tanana Reeve Du. And I have read two four and a half star books. So this kind of feels like a third time's a charm within the third time's a charm. So I'm going to read her short story, which is called Ghost Ship. So that's intriguing. And I'll update you on that tomorrow um, before I read the third official and final book for the actual vlog that we're in. I'm tired. Hello, good afternoon. I'm picking Liam up from school. He has requested we go on a boba date. So I'm happy to oblige. He has a new favorite boba place that I've never been to. So that's gonna be very exciting. I also am going to find uh, a free little library that can fit all of the books that I have with me. So wish me luck with that. I did in fact read Tanana Reeve Dew's story. It was called Ghost Ship and it was about um, a woman named Florida who was on a slave ship essentially and um, she was being tasked with something so it is like speculative and futuristic but naturally a lot of the stories are going to lean to history to tell futuristic stories and on this ship she's being tasked with something it was related to an animal it was very strange and since it's a short story like i can't give too much away but there were a couple things that brought danger to the story you thought it was one thing but it was something else i don't know what my rating is um yes i do it's a four. I really want Tanana Reeve Dew to get a five. Her books are so close to being a five. Technically, like the between, I gave an honorary five because it was so close. I'm gonna keep picking up from her and I have started The Last Housewife. I just stopped by the library and I picked up a couple things and I dropped off a couple things. I'm just really always at the library. One of them, you saw me get this book last time and now I have the CD audiobook. I thought I was requesting just the audiobook. Um, but it's a physical version. But I started in on The Last Housewife, the final book for the vlog. I'm gonna finish it today. It's a very fast read. And I just, I'm, I don't know if I, what word I would use, impressed, surprised. Ashley Winstead is being very bold with this book. You're following a woman who, the, the mystery in here is that a friend of hers is dead and she hears about it via a podcast from her other friend who has a podcast who i thought was a woman it's a man i think there's a budding romance which is fun because that's something that in my dreams i hold a knife had that i wasn't expecting was a little like relationship element that i really enjoyed just because of how it was written and handled it's not something i'm always looking for in a thriller but i liked it so i think that's also a thing in here as well with this guy named jamie i think his name was jamie it's not on the back what if he's a figment of her imagination anyway one of her friends died um and something happened with one of her friends back in school and then one of her friends died and another says podcast liam is coming at me real hot 
can you not do this in my school parking? Nobody can see me. Everybody can. Nope, there's nobody parked beside me. Literally everybody can see me. There's it. nobody beside me. I'll whisper so no one can see me or hear me. I can't talk about the things that happened to her now that my child is here. So we'll discuss those together later. First, Boba. And it. Liam just got a whole cup of chocolate. Yum! I love it. Oh yeah, we didn't cheers. Thanks for the date. What a magical time. Apologies. Six hours has passed since I saw you last. I made an incredible stir fry for dinner. I went and got groceries. I got the groceries before I made dinner. I hung out with Liammy. I filmed and edited a video. And now I'm here to finally talk to you about my progress of the book that I don't know where I put. For some reason I thought I picked a sweater that matched the cover, but I didn't really. First things first, my thought that I was having before. I think this was a really bold decision by this author to write this book the way that it's written. So it has to do with a sex cult kind of. It's not in the synopsis, but I don't consider it a spoiler because I think that that would be included in like any content warnings you would give. And from what I've seen from other reviewers is they wish they had known that going into the book. So Shay was involved in this cult and now she thinks that the cult is responsible for her dead friend. But the way that we're exploring Shay's backstory and how she got involved with this situation to begin with and the way that the cult runs and brings people in were very much in her mind as she's getting indoctrinated into it and therefore we're seeing things through her eyes so the much older man who is seducing her and is making her feel so special through her eyes it's a positive experience the scenes almost read as sexy because she deems him sexy. Even though as the reader, you know that that's wrong, but it's just kind of a mind fuck. And it's, I can see how this would be a lot for some people to read. At the same time, it doesn't feel gratuitous. I think we've all read, I mean, if you're a thriller reader and you've gotten into dark thrillers, you know that there are thriller authors who really talk about uncomfortable topics. And maybe because of the way that she is describing these scenes, she's getting away from that and finding a way to describe how these things are horrific without it feeling like the language is meant to make you feel sick. The ideas are sick, but the language is not descriptive. It is descriptive in that it's depicting abuse and violence and sexual encounters. But I just, the things that are actually occurring, in my opinion, are not being described in the type of detail that I was getting worried it was going to. Beyond needing to take breaks from the subject matter, this is an extremely readable story. It's fast paced, it's interesting, but at the same time, there's not a lot going on. You really do have just the one mystery throughout the entire thing, but you're meeting a lot of different characters, but not in a way that it feels like I need to remember all of them or I'm connecting all of these things. This takes a lot of skill and I understand why this was in a few people's favorites of the year. Now, do I come on here and just say it was a five star, pretend it was a five star so the video can have a five star? I would have no qualms in you thinking I gave this a five star because there's nothing really questionable in here for me. But yeah, in line with the entire rest of the video, this one was a four. I wouldn't hesitate to recommend it with the proper warnings to people who are looking for that like feminist thriller that really takes down a group and talks about things like power dynamics and consent and women's roles and what's expected of them. I really think this book perfectly well balanced um, these great discussions and takeaways and it's a good for her kind of story but it does offer you a main character who has questionable, I don't want to say morality. She's not a villainous character by any means but she comes across as someone you don't fully understand. And a lot of it is because of the life that she's lived and the situations that she's been in. As someone who doesn't really love cult stories and who's giving this a four, I 
It's obviously a cult story, but it doesn't feel like the cult stories that I have disliked. I saw someone in their review say that this was more of a secret society. And while, you know, there are so many things in common and it doesn't matter how we categorize, this doesn't to me feel like I enjoyed a cult book. <laughs> Though the discussions we're having very much align with the type of conversations you would expect to be having in a cult book. Power imbalances, the enigmatic leader, we're discussing things like whose role is what in a relationship and um, the women needing to be submissive and just give over to how the world wants them to behave. The writing is a five. The plot is a four. It's definitely one that could be translated into film very easily. It's telling a great story. It feels very cinematic, but it almost felt too cinematic. And I love myself a ridiculous thriller, but when the topics are so heavy, it felt like it shouldn't be as silly as it felt sometimes. And not in the ways the characters were behaving, but just the ways that the scenes played out. Shay and Jamie are obviously um, amateur detectives, investigators. I really enjoyed Jamie as a character and the way he supported her and the ways that they came together and worked together. But it was a little bit silly how they kept getting into these same scenarios and just weren't thinking things through. Even though the scenarios like kept happening the same way, they just kept getting out of things without any issue. But surprising what I did enjoy, the podcast is not, like this isn't mixed media as much as I thought it would be. You're really not listening to a podcast at any moment, though Jamie is making a podcast throughout their time together. Um, what is inserted is interviews with Shay and she's kind of exposing her story via these interviews. And I thought we would be getting the podcast transcript and I would have thought that it missing that would have brought it down a rating for me, but I wasn't missing it. I want to give it a higher rating because I respect what this is doing, but it was a four and that's not a bad rating. It's just that in a video looking for fives, it didn't happen. And as for my final thoughts, I'm now able to post this video. So I thought I'd hop in with just a little outro as I'm currently filming my next vlog. Can you guess the theme? I thought I'd do a little outro just to say, I will read from all of these authors again and the stakes of the video feel so much lower this season than other seasons because in other ones I was deciding will I ever read that author again and even if these had gotten super low ratings I would have read them all again because that wasn't the purpose of this was deciding that. I've already read five stars from these authors I am delighted to read from them over and over again but none of them have officially established themselves as what I can consider all-time favorite authors but we'll try again. Ashley Winstead, in fact, just announced a romance book coming soon. Also, I didn't mention the fact that I was mentioned in the acknowledgements of this book. So I wanted to then acknowledge Ashley Winstead for her support of the book community, her recognition of the people like pushing out work, supporting authors. And this has happened to me a couple times now. And it's just a beautiful and humbling moment of recognition. Her upcoming book in spring is called The Boyfriend Candidate. It follows a shy school librarian and a one night stand with Logan, the foul mouthed stranger she meets at a hotel bar. As we can gather, he's a politician. And I think that's really in line with the things that she is talking about even in her other romance. I'm definitely excited to pick it up. And then Celeste Ng, I think there's been five years between each of her novels, so who knows when there will be another one from her, but she is featured in this. It's called The 14 Days. It says it's a novel. There seems to be 25 characters, 25 chapters, 25 perspectives, 25 short stories, I'm not totally sure, making this up, and each one is written by a different author. And it says secretly written by a different author, so that's very intriguing to me that you won't know who's responsible for what, if I'm understanding this properly. And then I know Adipa Jagadar has one coming out, The Do's and Donuts of Love, in spring, and it's a queer YA romance that takes place during a baking competition. I'll definitely follow this author regardless, but I am intrigued to see if she writes older someday, because I would be very intrigued to pick that up. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. If you got to the end, I had a good time this week reading these three. And now the next video you'll see from me is another vlog with more books. So I will see you then. Bye.